Welcome to Book Rising, a podcast by the Radical Books Collective. Hi everyone, welcome to Book Rising, our Radical Books Collective podcast. And very excited to be here today with the co-founder, Suchitra Vijayan, who was instrumental in founding this particular initiative. And today we are uh, recording a session for our Radical Publishing Future series, uh, which has been amplifying small presses, independent presses. uh, And now we're doing a little mini section on what can be called a crisis in uh, in publishing today, in Western publishing today, especially with regards to race. And uh, Suchitra and I will debrief all of you on um, a pen report that came out um, in October 2022 and which uh, speaks in great detail about the racism in publishing, uh, about the pervasive lack of diversity in publishing. Um, and we'll, we'll walk you through it. We are both pretty uh, moved and shocked by this report and uh, hopefully this will be helpful moving forward and trying to understand publishing and also uh, think through solutions on how to make it better. So Chitra, I want to start by asking you um, what brings you to uh, into publishing? uh, What makes you invested in this topic? I think two things. One, um, I think first and foremost, I'm a writer and I've always wanted to be a writer and I've had the um, add both the um, the great joy and the disaster, (laughs) disastrous heartbreak of publishing uh, one book um, already. And and then now um, I have multiple other projects in work. Second, I, um, I'm also someone who's invested in understanding what it takes for us to publish important stories, whether it is through the Polis project, whether it's Wattscapes, whether it's radical books. Um, I'm truly invested in what it means for us to think about writing, not only as telling stories, but creating a canon, expanding a canon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, completely understand. And I think we've both talked about this before. Uh, I have not published with the trade press, but I have written a lot for magazines and stuff like that. And I do edit uh, a series for a New York publisher. So, and when I was uh, at university, I worked part time as a scout, as an assistant to a scout. And what that meant was when new books came out, uh, we you know, my boss and I looked at those books to see if they're viable to become Hollywood films. Um, So, you know, yes, publishing's commercial, understanding publishing in the commercial sense, but also commercial multiplied by 10 when Hollywood comes into the picture. And I think over the years, having run a magazine uh, and uh, having had a foot in a New York publishing world, I would say both of us are part of uh, whisper networks, uh, of what it f- means to be on the outside, what it means to be uh, women of color, uh, and not just women of color, but also people from other countries, um, and how to find a footing um, in the U.S. with all that, with all that kind of stuff that comes, all that being othered in the way that, you know, people like us tend to be. Um, let's start with this report. So it's, it's, it, was, uh, it was put together by PEN America in October 2022. Uh, and I was quite devastated when I read it. It's about 65 pages or so. Um, and, uh, you know, divided into five sections clearly written, there are case studies, there are incredible quotations. Um, And what it gives us is a picture of a publishing industry that is, you know, not just white, but almost white supremacist at some level. I mean, it's just, it is actually, you know, I knew that it was white, but um, the numbers, 80%, 90% with regards to staff diversity, with regards to actual publications, um, I think they were really shocking for me. Uh, So, you know, maybe we can go with first reactions and then break it down section by section. I think the first reaction, as you said, is that it's not that none of us are not aware of this. I think we are all very clearly aware of this. The awareness comes from your own experience of trying to get a book published, trying to have your ideas heard, 
um constantly being told that um the number of times you know um i think you know this i have a spreadsheet of uh, rejections and unkind words <laughs> um i'm okay with the rejections but the unkind words is a pretty interesting ways in which the kind of things mm. that actually said to me about how a project like this is not possible a project like this is too complicated for us to sell a project like this um just not right for someone with like you who just doesn't have the experience um so one it's we know the difficulty of getting something interesting ideas to print even if they are not perfect second of course is that there's a difference between anecdotally experiencing all of this and finding all of this on print the moment you find this on print um it is just devastating it's heartbreak right it's the heartbreak of knowing that what you've always known subconsciously is indeed fact um and how it's also that there's also a lot of gaslighting that happens in terms of writers absolutely um, so also the, it's not that and it's very clear that just because one of us makes it doesn't mean that all of us has made it it actually means that every year if there's one brown writer or a black writer from a very specific african country who makes it it doesn't mean that it opens doors for other nigerian uh, writers or other kenyan writers it simply means that there's going to be the sole voice for the next few years before magically someone has to do another breakthrough so these are Absolutely. just my um initial um reactions to this report yeah uh i think one of the um you know i think i i'm an academic and so i think one of the things that i always get fixated on when i think about uh publishing is of course um how books are reviewed and there is a little section about how books are reviewed because reviews really create the space for more such books or for you know explain the book and how it moves in the world so the work that reviews does is super important but i think i've tended too much maybe to think about uh, the work of reviews and less on the actual people who choose the books which are of course acquisitions editors uh, agents um and i think i like the way in which this particular report takes us through the entire pipeline and the other thing that i have tended to not think very much about because i've not been working in an office in a in a press you know uh is how the staff are treated who is hired what are hiring practices um you know are, are there diverse people uh are there leaders um you know are there are there people in leading positions rather who are people of color so i like this um reports very strong and fairly detailed section on staff diversity uh retention practices all of those kinds of things so i think that was very refreshing to me and uh, and then the other uh, the other aspect of it that was um of course interesting was um the way in which publishing industry tends to think you know tends to create a very finite space for certain types of books and writers so as you said if there is one successful writer from nigeria that that's it you know for 5 years there may not be any more you know uh because the space is very finite and years ago i was uh, peddling a book um a translation of a, of a, of a book about the rwandan genocide and at that time philip gorovich had published his very much of a best seller book um on rwandan genocide and so everywhere i went with that particular novel totally different not a work of reportage everyone said oh but you know there's already philip gorovich's work and the absurdity of that idea you know um meanwhile there's a million different books about certain topics that never go out of fashion you know world war 2 narratives um or you know i don't know there's there's so many like that so i think i think it was interesting to see it through the lens of this report how that stuff actually works behind the scenes uh but anyway let's start so it's divided into five sections let's go section by section uh so the first section i believe is was called um uh was offers a snapshot of the transitions afoot in the industry uh any thoughts on the first uh, section i think uh 
there were some interesting things there about the cycle of progression and regression. We mm -hmm. go through phases. Suddenly, everyone's like, oh, my God, publishing is very racist. Let's publish a bunch of writers. And then, boom, the phase is <laughs> gone. Uh, anyway, what do you think? I also liked, um, I think the section one actually starts with the word, the color of publishing. Mm. Um, and then it's also interesting that they call it the um, the corpus of stories, you know. Yes. Um, and I think, I think what we really need to understand or rather I'm increasingly getting frustrated with is even the use of the word racial diversity. Um, so I think we also really need to understand what racial diversity means. Um, are we thinking about diversity of ideas? Are we thinking mm -hmm. about uh, what geographical locations and stories? So I think mm -hmm. it's so important for us to not flatten out what racial diversity means. It's not just, I think there's something more to it in terms of diversity. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. And I was going to save the criticism of that for later, but we've dived right into it. I think uh, despite the strengths of this uh, particular report, uh, it remains actively American. So I think the, the definition of diversity in this particular report is just, it's really just the groups that are in the US. And that leaves out, of course, the whole other world, which is the world of translation, you know, uh, the world of international writers, the world of, you know, your book, for example, is about India. And in a way, it's, it's you know, everyone should read that. Why not? Um, should only Indians read about India? You know, this is the kind of, this is the sort of um, constant blind spot around who, who, who is the reader of certain books. And even though the report points out that this is a blind spot, you know, uh, with, uh, you know, writers of color, um, they fail to kind of include a very vast kind of international population within that. And of course, other languages and so on. Uh, but for the sake of, I think, this report, um, I think we, we are we are going to be ending up talking about primarily African American slash black uh, and uh, Hispanic slash Latinx. Um, and uh, those are the two main categories that tend to, uh, there's not even a lot of stuff about Asians and so on here. Um, but okay, so yeah, uh, I like the idea, the color of publishing. The color of publishing <laughs> is white, but the nationality of publishing is staunchly American. <laughs> Let's just say that. Um, there are some interesting um, charts, of course, in here. Um, and they talk, they introduce us to the concept of the big five that used to be big six, now it's big five. And then if there's some major merger that will happen, it'll be big four. Um, and I think what was interesting, of course, is that they're starting with what's happening now in publishing. And I just wanted to say that uh, there's something so wrong with taking stock of a situation because a man called George Floyd was murdered in broad daylight, you know, right at the outset. This is so screwed up, right? Uh, but fine, it, it brings us here. Um, and they talk about the two scandals, and I don't know if you have a memory of these. Uh, publishing paid me, and hashtag publishing paid me, and hashtag we need diverse books. Do you remember this stuff ongoing on Twitter? Um, I do remember this stuff. Um, I remember this stuff because this happened around the time when I was actually editing my manuscript. And I really wanted to be a part of this thing and say how poorly my publisher paid me. But I was actually <laughs> afraid because I was like, okay, my first book is coming out. Do I, do I do this? I'm literally in conversation with my editor every single day to do mm -hmm. the last edits of mine. But... I remember going through, um, I was more invested in publishing paid me than we need diverse books because I I've, I've, I've have a very uncomfortable relationship with the idea of diversity when, mm -hmm. when that is used as a very easy phrase to obfuscate everything else that is happening. Publishing paid me, I remember. I also remember the anger and the angst and the, just the pain of what it means for people to, you know, just not have enough or get paid to do the work that is so important. And also, I think um, it was very interesting for me to also see this um, in some of the um, authors that were quoted was, quote turned up, right? Yeah, yes, they were predominantly black and uh, Latin, right? Mostly black writers, I think, with mm -hmm. the courage to 
openly talk about their experiences. <coughs> there were a handful of um, Latinx and Asian writers, but I think mostly Asian writers were. I mean, so when I say Asian, I mean South Asian writers were also absent from this, and also a yeah. lot of white men who write were absent. Yeah, a lot of white people did turn up in solidarity with fellow writers, and I'm very grateful that they did. And they kind of, I mean, yeah. it's also important that you want them to be traitors to this entire publishing policy. Mm -hmm. You, but, when you say turned up, you're talking about people inputting what they got paid on that yes. Excel sheet that went around, right? Yes. yes, because that is also important. Because I can say I got paid five thousand dollars for a book, but. Mm -hmm. I that only makes sense if I know that somebody else got two hundred thousand dollars for the exact same kind of book. It's crazy, right? So I think yeah. it was important that we had, but again, it's important that it was mostly white women and or queer people. Again, in my recollection of it, I'm I'm not sure. I yeah. don't have access to the, the spreadsheet anymore. Mm -hmm. At one point in time, the spreadsheet was open. I don't think it is anymore. I don't think the link was working when I tried checking it earlier. Um. But the white men were absent, and you might powerful white men who still continue to get the big chunk of advances were absent from this, and it was very interesting for me when I was reading this report that another writer had also observed the same thing. Um, but at the end of it, um, I think some of them were able to negotiate slightly better rates. Mm -hmm. but it should not be the the burden of fighting for every little morsel shouldn't fall on the writer. Writing is a burden on itself, given how yeah. hard it is. Mm -hmm. uh, we need diverse books. Yes, I remember it. Um, but I actually remember some other thing. I think uh, more than we need diverse books, I think the Twitter thread that really caught my imagination was <coughs> the archivist at New Yorker. Erin mm. um, Overby, I think, wrote an incredible thread that shows how, as you said, not only white, but white supremacist, something like the New York <laughs> is. And I remember another statistics that she puts out is that while the print continues to be very white, the online um, uh, New Yorker, the New Yorker that's only for the web, had increasingly started having more black voices and, and brown voices. I mean, again, when I say brown, it's mostly Latinx and others, but it's also interesting how the digital is seen as perhaps less prestigious um, or yes. maybe seen as more open to experimenting. Um, all words used to, again, define what the canon is, which still is seen as the print, which is white. So I think more than the Vini diverse books, I think Erin's thread um, from 2021 September, if I'm not mistaken, on New Yorker and the diversity, because I think New Yorkers... New Yorker has a huge effect and impact on what gets published. Mm -hmm. They are a direct correlation and also a pipeline into, you know, um, yeah. large publishing advances. And so I found that threat to be far more interesting than the hashtag and the discourse around the we mm -hmm. need books uh, hashtag. Right, right, right. Yeah, I think that's that's super interesting. I do remember all of these Twitter threads proliferating. And I think uh, what's interesting about the publishing paid me and the knowledge of the giant advances and then eventually um, writers of color ending up with such advances that it comes back to bite them because uh, if they don't, if the if the press doesn't make the money back, if the big publishers don't make the money back, then then that failure comes to sort of, you know, the whole community pays a price for it. Oh, that black books don't sell or, uh, you know, Latinx YA books don't sell or something, something ridiculous like that. Um, so, yeah, I think, uh, I think, I think it was interesting. And, you know, um, and at the end of the day, the social media and this sort of uh, citizen kind of, um, I don't want to say citizen journalism, but this kind of citizen activism is what gets us to start having these conversations that have been suppressed for years and decades. You know, um, let's get to section two, uh, which is uh, to quote them. It addresses recruitment and retention, delineating how the lack of staff diversity impedes the autonomy and authority of editors and executives of color and limits the book that are acquired and how they are marketed and sold. And I found this to be an extraordinary and important um, uh, section of this particular report and one that I haven't perhaps thought about enough. Um, and, uh, you know, I think they get to the pipeline issue, uh, which is like 
the 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 pipeline when you work in publishing you start perhaps as editorial assistant and then you move up and so on and so forth and that somehow that pipeline is very complicated and difficult and it's it's you know people of color are at a disadvantage because of their networks because of course the pay is very low in publishing uh and so you what we have ended up in is very few senior people uh of color in publishing we have very few uh, big name editors who acquire uh books and so on and it tends to be uh, insanely white um the other thing was the hostile work environment i had not thought of that but my god uh, some of the stories that were told in that uh, and the reported microaggressions uh, were pretty shocking to me actually anyway go on i'll i'll hand it to you um no i think um I think I just very quickly want to go over the numbers because I I think um it's yeah, important. So the numbers is that publishing industry is 79% white. Executives within public in the publishing industry are 86% white. Yikes. Editorial departments are 82% white. Sales is 83% white. Marketing and publicity is 77% white. And mm-hmm. book reviewers uh, are 89% white. Amazing. So <laughs> and i think how this translates is i've um and i also want to kind of go back to the idea of the money that mm-hmm. uh, people of color I and mean, again i'm flattening it out is or given is that an advance no matter which what size your publishing is i mean if it's one of the major um <clears throat> fives and you know in the publishing how much money your publisher is willing to put towards you as an advance of good indication of how much time and effort they will spend trying to promote your book yeah i've had first hand experience of how poorly mm-hmm. in marketing and sales treat writers of color when i have taken concerns to head of marketing with my own publisher i was literally told looks like there are problems and you're coming to us and we're trying to solve this for you this is the best that we can do if all of this is too much for you maybe this is not the industry you should be in wow imagine the head of marketing telling this to you after you are the one who has consistently gone out to promote the book do the work and they couldn't even get the basic things like the registration link working mhm i was once set up for a book talk in a non-existent bookstore that was selling books on the sidewalk wow and imagine and i was never given the opportunity i know the book came out in the middle of covid but i was never really given the opportunity to even go sign books because it's the first time out these are things that you want to do mhm and the ways in which you are constantly gaslit into believing that the crumbs that they throw is something that you should be grateful for and as a first time writer someone with no literary connections in the us trying to get your foot in you're constantly advised that any time you demand for something that is yours then you become the difficult person you become the angry black woman stereotype you become the angry brown woman absolutely you are the one who are seen as being difficult mm-hmm. the institution that is built to consistently um demean you um is not ever critiqued apart from this broader critique but never quite the institutional critique mm-hmm. and the other thing is also how i mean book reviewers are 89% white i've had my experience of trying to yeah. reach editors and 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 reviewers who do this work for the new yorker and the new york times and all of this and just the absolute ways in which they dismiss someone that they don't think is important there is mm-hmm. no effort to cultivate writers there's no effort to trying to discover new ones what a lot of these editors do is they ride on the bandwagon of someone who's already bought them on a silver platter because they know there is large publishing budget to do this or it's it's trends chasing right you're chasing a trend of someone who is considered cool and hip mm-hmm. and they're not really investing or making time to discover a writer invest in them but once they become big then you choose yeah. time to um, so i think there are also those kind of issues that disproportionately affect people mm-hmm. and I, th- i think it also might have a problem with people who 
come from working who might be white who might be um but who also come from working class backgrounds i think they i think the idea that you are working class and you're writing mm-hmm. is also something that's almost impossible like how many working class writers do we have today in 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 publishing industry absolutely it's a very bourgeois profession and writing in itself you know there is something to be said about having a laptop and having you know having a space and not having to clock in every day somewhere you know so at the end of the day it's a vocation uh that demands uh, a certain um, you know a certain setup a certain saving some backup you know uh and then it kind of colludes with an even more intensely bourgeois um industry so um why do you think why do you think though that your experience was the way it was i mean i'm just saying because i know you have a huge twitter following i think you're very good at sort of um you know promoting the book you're not like you know uh, sluggish about uh, selling whatever you're writing so you know was it really the content that was extremely alienating you think was that the issue no i think it was just i think publishing is just very white mm-hmm. it is these institutions are just not open to people who are diverse i don't know the i don't think they know how to i i think they just don't know how to treat people well i think there's also a fundamental disrespect that they think that can offer people and get away with it yeah a I condescension think, you mean a condescension um second i think there is um for example in, in my case uh the marketing wasn't talking to publicity they didn't even know that there was problems with the printing of my book mm. and i was sent an email saying hey can you do a reading of can you send me a video of you reading from a book and i'm like do you not know that there's been issues with the printing i don't even have a copy of the book yeah right so and um you're just not considered important enough uh mm-hmm. there were instances where i've been mistaken for another writer who's pakistani <laughs> um there've been instances where uh um, it's not funny but that's horrible uh, and 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 i've had instances where people have turned up i've not even done the basic courtesy of just finding out who the author is and reading a completely yeah. different bio mm-hmm. um so at that point in time it is not the content of the book but because i don't really think they understand the content of the book or may have made any effort to understand who i am or my book mm-hmm. i just think that the culture of disrespect is so prevalent Mm-hmm. the culture of ass kissing is so prevalent that the only two uh default modes that you can get is unconditional ass kissing to somebody with power and prestige and literary access and unconditional condescension and disregard to someone who you think doesn't have it right and i think because the stakes are so low mm-hmm. the nasty is just infinitely more yeah um, and that's what happens when the stakes are so low in terms of resources and few people get to control it and they know that the chances of someone challenging all of this yeah is just um mm-hmm. you know what what I mean, even today i have never publicly gone and said anything because i've been consistently advised that no yeah you'll ruin your chances, your chances. you'll ruin your future chances. don't yeah. do this do not don't be difficult don't do this they might not do this for you they might not do that for you um mm-hmm. for instance i didn't even know my book was being uh, auditioned my book was being sold to an audio book and they got a british man to read my audio book like i i mean the point is just and then yeah. i find out two days before the audio book drops that this has happened not yeah. even once considering yeah. that you might want to think mm-hmm. about um i mean I i'm i'm not british i might have studied in england but i don't have a british accent i'm very much indian i am to my today i might have an american passport but i don't sound the way i speak mm-hmm. the function of every city that i've lived in also imagine, the book is pretty anti british <laughs> colonialism <laughs> yes so imagine hiring a british asian man to read a book yeah um imagine the kind of time and thought you've not invested I know. In um absolutely. So I mean again as I said I am in I mean again I am incredibly lucky because yeah I got a book deal which apparently 99.9% of people don't. Right. Right? So it's also that sense of a culture of disrespect that allows them 
mm-hmm. to do anything and get away with it and also whether a bad pr um yeah. thread or uh you know right. they will weather this because writers are not going to stop mm-hmm. being signed on to your publishing house right mm-hmm. i think we to- yeah absolutely i think we have naturally gone into section 3 so i'm going to just quickly say something about section 2 which is about uh, lack of staff diversity in publishing uh and very quickly say that some of the testimonies uh from uh black and brown staff uh was uh, always typecasting them oh you know uh you must know about uh this this type of book but it's like okay i may not know this genre right so always being in a defensive position or if they have to sell if they want to acquire a book by a black or brown author they're always on the defensive have to sell way harder will it will it be uh, you know will it be viable is there readership etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think this is a really good section i really uh, urge people to people to go through it and to uh, to read it and then section 3 is more of some of the stuff you just talked about which uh, are long standing attitudes and platitudes that have shaped the way the publishing industry has dealt with books by authors of color including the shibboleth diverse books don't sell right and this i think you're very much a victim Uh, of that and i think uh you know there are other uh, horrible uh, sort of stereotypes at play uh, that impede uh, progress in this area uh, black people don't read you know there is a horrible uh, anecdote where a, uh, a korean american author uh, writing about uh, adoption was asked are there other people who have had the same experience that may read your book the notion that you only want to read books about a yourself uh this is not true right uh and also that the readership continually tends to be white whereas you have massive readerships uh in black brown migrant communities so it's a really problematic thing and i think uh the point of this particular section was that one exists in a monocultural sensibility right um and uh, and and then those writers of color also get get trapped with one genre if one genre is successful a novel a memoir a young adult book then it's sort of like that's it you know uh let's let let's not diversify let's just stick to more authors of the same genre of the same color so it's a very it's a very strange um it's a very strange universe and from my end um you know thinking a little bit about this idea of diverse books uh don't sell or like a complete alienation from diverse books my experience um editing uh, a book series that primarily uh features uh writers of color and books about decolonization there is a real um you know the marketing team seem to be a bit lost on how am i selling this book where am i selling it like it's it it puts them totally out of their comfort zone which deeply disadvantages my writers and so on even in terms of setting up events and stuff there might be the intention but one is locked into this extreme othering extreme alienation uh how do i how do i sell this how do i generate readers it's it's really painful i mean it's not just um the marketing right i think it's also that somehow you're told that only a white man can be a renaissance man that mm-hmm. as somehow um for me i would always get very irritated when people would say just box me in this one category right mm-hmm. um i've done many things you know um i've done many things i've m- m- explored things in multiple formats i i write i take photographs i'm interested in the ways in which text and form um coincide um while india is my most recent subject of study i am not a south asian as by training i've worked in predominantly mm-hmm. non south asian geographical regions in terms of conflict and war and somehow you have to shrink yourself in order to be sold mm-hmm. and i think that is something um that i struggle with and i think it's also important for us to very clearly state that publishers create the audience publishers play an important role in creating marketing mm-hmm. if a book hasn't sold if a good book hasn't sold it's not because 
um, the book wasn't good. Um, it is because the publisher really didn't invest the time and the energy to sell the book. And the selling now also signals where the book will be placed. Yeah. And if you do not invest, and a lot of publishers now don't, because now the writer has to be the writer, the editor, um, the, the writer has to now be the marketing person. You also reduced everybody to a brand, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think sometimes writers become writers because sometimes you don't want to speak. Sometimes I just don't want to speak. I just want my book to do the speaking. But not all of a sudden you are a brand. You are supposed to look a certain way. You're supposed to speak a certain way. You're supposed to dress a certain way. You're supposed to now tag designers and brands and books. Um, <laughs> oh, and one, is, one is just left with this. Um, one is then becomes a Frankenstein monster of brand, you know, branding yeah. and brand equity than someone as a writer trying to write and get better. Uh, and mm -hmm. I think that, that it's very important for us to make the connection between this marketing as a way to sell books, but also what this marketing then ends up unleashing on the mm -hmm. writer and sometimes actually reducing the writer to um, a Frankenstein monster of brands and endorsements <laughs> and Instagram reels as against totally. actually just trying to write. And we all have to do it because you're worried if you don't sell a book, the next time you go to a publisher, they're going to say, what are your marketing? What are your book sales? And they're never going to say the publisher didn't do enough job of it. They're never going to say, they're going to say your book didn't sell because your book didn't find Absolutely. Out. So I think Absolutely. that's what we're going to for us to kind of state and keep stating over and over again yeah and the last two sections of the report are shorter but they do uh, do think a little bit about what you're saying section four is about uh, author advances and the use of comps which is what you're talking about comparative sales figures uh, then they allow uh, the writers allow the publishers to project how much a certain book might sell and of course it perpetuates um, existing inequities for authors of color according to the report and that of course makes sense so unless you've had a build out of some other writer and your your comp projections are exactly the same uh your book may never enter even this particular pipeline right and then the last section focuses on marketing distribution and sales and disadvantages within that uh for authors of color and in here i think the thing that um uh you know, we seem to come up again, again and again, against again and again, is the notion of very low budgets for marketing and PR and distribution. Uh, if the book is not a priority book, that there is a hierarchy that exists. And if the PR marketing people are not convinced this book is going to sell, I mean, they don't want to tank it, but they tank the books. You know, because they just refuse to invest in it. To sell something, you have to first invest money into it, energy into it, and also like invest in the language. What is the book? Read the book. You know, how, how, you know, how can one sell the book? How can we draw readers from communities that you're not accustomed to, um, working with? Things like that. Uh, and there's a very interesting quote by Elizabeth Mendez Berry, who, uh, I have interviewed actually for another one of our um, Radical Publishing Futures series. And she says, a budget is a moral document. When we talk about diversity, we need to understand what that means financially. And that includes like everything from author advances to marketing budgets, uh, to distribution, all of those things. And uh, I think that's so interesting to kind of engage the ethics right away within the budget because the budget is always used as an excuse as an excuse that is neutral like the budget is outside of the of the publishing uh, ethos or it's outside of literary concerns but it's not you know it's a moral document and i kind of love that quote no i think um i think before it becomes a moral document it's an economic document which is also a political document which Absolutely. then kind of very clearly says um what resources do we think that mm -hmm. this work deserves? Which means that you're initi you're beginning this process by giving a value which is arbitrary based mm -hmm. on factors that are arbitrary. Mm 
but that arbitrariness is also created it's very much man made right you are creating hierarchies and that hierarchies allows you to thrive in the different you know um um now this is increasingly becoming more and more like marx but i mean the the, the different <laughs> right the whoever owns the means of production um and i think Absolutely. that line is very important but i kind of also just want to like i know i know that we've almost uh, we've been speaking about this for a little while mm-hmm. but i also want to talk about the ways in which publishing successes and failures also kind of um affects discourses i have met uh, brown writers who before they achieve a certain kind of success will openly be critical of the institutions and structures of hierarchies of power that are problematic and mm-hmm. the moment they become published they attain a certain level of success they will continue to talk about platitudes of diversity representation but then also kind of start inhabiting in a certain kind of silences where they will no longer speak up because now somehow they've made it to mm-hmm. this where they've received a certain kind of respectability based on their success mm-hmm. and i've seen this increasingly happen where your arguments for diversity or the the the, the noise decibel of your arguments kind of keeps going lower and lower as you achieve a certain kind of critical success within this white publishing as a person of color yeah 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 no absolutely you know and actually what you're saying is something that also struck me in the report itself but also you know just the sheer amount of interviews i've done and talked to you know writers of color people of color and so on and um you know there's always this disdain i'm being typecast i'm being asked to recommend more black or brown authors and how dare they i can recommend white authors too and i just i never understand that you know <laughs> i never i never understand why not just be an advocate take it you know what i mean typecasting sucks but the 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 you know the the communities are so low on that ladder it's okay if they have to climb on your back you know why not have an advocacy stance rather than being upset um about being constantly asked to advocate for other people like yourself and so on i don't know am i saying something problematic here it's you know it's just it's just something that that gets me a little bit when people are like i'm just a writer i'm not a writer of color i'm just a, you know <laughs> and i don't know i know it's complicated unpack my own issues for me suchitra <laughs> i mean yeah but it's also the the labor you're put into like there's this labor sure. that you're constantly subject to um about everything around it mm-hmm. um but eventually um i think i think we i think some of us i believe um again i know i'm flattening it out when i say writers of color we have a moral obligation to expand the canon absolutely and expanding the canon means then that we have to resist the neoliberal need to say the first book of this nature the first the um, uh, the top um 10 authors to look out for <laughs> that's how neoliberalism thrives right to be the first book and i know and the obsession with the individual you know i i know a friend of mine was deeply upset when a certain book was called the first um novel of a certain kind um and my response was i understand it's frustrating but mm-hmm. the system also constantly pits all of us against each other right as if like we can no longer be happy for the success of a book because the way the success is defined completely mm-hmm. erases the canon you Absolutely. call something a first book of this kind to be published which is not true nothing i mean human civilization is now over <laughs> a few thousand years <laughs> nothing yeah. is first anymore yeah every idea that you've thought about is already been perhaps thought about by someone else yeah so the neoliberal culture of the top 10 the best the the first book of this kind the first author of this kind the first mm-hmm. really militates against the idea of expanding the canon absolutely we need to expand the canon and expanding the canon means mm-hmm. that we make space for um some incredibly terrible assholes who might still produce work totally <laughs> that is important totally and it's it's never enough to say i just want to be called a uh, called a writer it is 
painful, but it's not a level playing field. It is unfortunately a burden we carry. And uh, of course, you know, when Radical Books Collective started, I used to trot out this quote from Toni Morrison called um, Canon building is empire building. And, you know, I like to think of it any which way, you know, uh, if we want to build our alternate empire, if we are reshaping the canon, you know, there are many ways uh, to consider that. But um, all right. So I think we should we should end here. And yeah. uh, uh, essentially, can I, can I end with the suggestion for a Radical Books T-shirt? Is that what you want? No, we should have a T-shirt that says the canon is too damn small. <laughs> <laughs> like the rent is too damn high, you should be like the cannon is too damn. Small. Explode the cannon. I would rather yeah. do that. Yeah. Um, so essentially, this is this. Uh, I just want to remind our uh, listeners that this is a first debrief on the on the uh, on the three part series. Ours being the first, which is a debrief on the crisis in publishing when it comes to racism. I know we didn't touch upon gender, but that's a whole other uh, can of worms right there. Um, but uh, there are two other episodes uh, planned along with this. Uh, one will be with Elizabeth Mendez Berry, uh, who is significantly included in that pen report, uh, along with Portia Burke, uh, also an incredible and a large figure in uh, American publishing. And then a second one that focuses uh, exclusively on the UK. Uh, because uh, U.S. is so loud and U.S. books sell so much and it's so corporate, U.K. tends to remain under the radar, but they are just as bad, just as racist. And we have Margaret Busby and Ella Wakatama uh, spilling the tea on that. So uh, stay tuned for both those things. That was fun, Suchitra. I think we could have gone on for hours, but we shouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I feel like these are increasingly becoming like my therapy session, which is important for my sanity. So great. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, you're welcome. Thanks so much. All right. Bye.